already seen the title of the video, so I don't really need to go into that. But essentially, this came about because John first saw my video where I said this. The general public don't care these days. So I used to have ideas that when I started busting out cuts at a gig, I'd get rapturous applause afterwards. And frankly, it's just not the case. At least not for me anyway. It turns out John doesn't necessarily agree. And who am I to argue someone who's done all of this in his career? We've got a DMC champion and a whole load of hardware and kit. And this is going to be very special. <laughs> John's one of my buds from the Scratchnet and he agreed to a conversation where we could talk about this further. During the conversation, we touched on a load of cool stuff like knowing your audience, when to include scratching and how John thinks about this when he's dropping it in his sets, scratching in different genres and generally just turntables perception in the wider spectrum of everything, I guess. Just loads of cool stuff basically. So yeah, stay tuned. Here's that conversation. Whoa. So, so had you seen my video where I said the general public don't care about scratching? Yeah, it was like a, forgive me if I say the title wrong, it was like seven tips or something like that. Seven things I wish I knew about scratching. That was it, yeah. Yeah, so in my experience, and I, I kind of mentioned this in the video, I was like, you know, when I scratch in front of people, no one seems to care. So you must have been watching that and been like, well, actually, that's not true. Well, Sometimes yes, sometimes no. On this particular topic, I feel that as DJs, um, a lot of what we do or maybe should do is know your audience or be able to read the audience in front of you and also understand the context at which you're, you're playing in. For example, if you're playing in a bar, doing some research on the venue before you play, understanding what their vibe is there and Build, building up a few ideas of like crates of records that you think may work, but then having like backup plans if they don't, that sort of thing. And knowing that's probably where you're going to be and you can test the water and see where you can take it, right? And I kind of feel the same thing with scratching. Reading the room and seeing how you could incorporate it within that context. Trying to recreate the context of what you would do at a, a freestyle scratch jam that we all love as, as scratch nerds in a club environment is a pretty difficult task to achieve. The analogy we, we spoke about the other day was going to see a virtuoso guitarist play. Guitarists love that, but uh, if you think about a normal like rock gig, for example, there's gonna probably be a solo in, in a band set across an hour, but most of it's gonna be riffs that people, like melodies or whatever that people catch onto and lock onto and dance to or however they enjoy that particular style of rock music. Scratching is a lot like that. Uh, in, in a jam scenario, a lot of it is solo based and it's about showing your chops. It's about, yeah, like pushing your, your technique really. And in front of an audience, uh, unless you have that sort of audience, which again is really only ever going to be in like a jam scenario, maybe like if you have like a a, a, a known DJ comes to the jam and they might get to do a showcase, which is all about shredding. That's probably the only context you can really get away with doing that. But you, you are known for kind of two things, I guess, right? But you, you have your, your turntablism sets, but just to be clear for people listening, you're not really talking about that, you're because you do DJ sets as well. So you're talking about more that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess for some, for some context, um, in terms of performing, like, like outside of a studio environment, I do two things. Like I, I do club DJing and it's, and it's, I treat it as like, from a more like hardcore DJing perspective of like, I want to do lots of like double drops and blends and quick mixes. And for me, put in the work of being a more technical minded DJ. So I, I will do some scratching and I will do some like blending and things like that. But my pr priority is like making people dance and enjoy it. And I'm just kind of like sprinkling the scratchy stuff around it. Sometimes I'll drop a routine if the song makes sense in the context of the set. So like I have plenty of material that sometimes I just have to scrap because it doesn't work, which is can be frustrating. Um, if, if you, especially if you've made something new and you really want to show it, it might just not work in that context and you have to save it for another time. But that's part of that role of a DJ reading the room and playing. Uh, the other thing I do are live performances. 
Uh, most recently, I've been doing that with a producer from Denmark called Shield. And that is essentially an hour, an hour plus of just routines using our own music. My role in the group is like I'm, I'm doing some scratching, play like a sampler and a little bit of keyboard. Hola. That is all about performing. But even within, within that, it's having dynamics within it. I think if I was to try and shred in that performance, even with our own material for an hour, it's going to be too much. It's about scattering those moments around to make it engaging and give expectations and like make people really want it rather than just going yeah. shredding for an hour. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm not scratching. Like I scratch in every single song, so it's doing like melodies or like some sort of hook or vocal hook or little fills and things like that. And then sometimes ripping up and doing like a more of like a traditional shredding up a sample scratching part. So, so when you're doing your like DJ sets, how, how do you like work it in and what's your thought process there? Um, my thought process is, is, is there space in this song? Have I previously let records breathe or have I been all about like quick mixes and changing to the next song all the time? Have I just let something groove for a while? And if there is that space and I have left some time, then I will do maybe like eight or 16 bars and think of it like, how, how is it going to be introduced? And then how is it going to end? Like my transitions in and out of scratching. What's going to happen with the music afterwards? Like, is it just going to keep on rolling? Am I going to try and transition straight away into another song as I finish my, my scratching literally on the next bar? <laughs> So are we talking like R and Fresh or are you taking samples from this track that you're mixing in, for instance, and then scratching that or? Um, I've been guilty of being the R and Fresh guy as well, because you get to, those samples are atonal, so they're in key with most things. I'll just jam over stuff. Uh, but then other things I will have routines or I'll have dug out a sample maybe that a producer had used in the song. I think having stuff like Scratch Decks allows you a little, a little bit more flexibility because you don't have to dig for your playlist anymore. Um, you can just grab that sample without having to dig for it and then even be preparing the next mix when, when you have your sample ready too. It's, I think it's a, there's a lot more improvisation where than in, in it now compared to there was before. So you said like that, you know, you get different reactions. So are you like testing the waters? You will sort of just be like, right, let's do this, see what happens. Do, are you expecting like a cheer or are you just expecting people to be like, do you, know, what, do you know what I mean? What kind of reaction are you looking for? Oh, um, I mean, in an ideal situation, I, I think I would be <laughs> like try, trying to like win the audience over and get them more hype into the set and focus on on what what I'm doing. Like, I want people to like obviously have fun and, and enjoy it. But like, if if they want to dance, they can dance. If they want to nerd out. I welcome that too, because like I enjoy like really putting effort in and preparing stuff, or some combination of the two. Sometimes it works. Sometimes people stop and not for the reasons that I want them to. So I may, might do less, but most of the time, like I find it works as long as like I'm picking the right moments. With the other thing of performing, um, there's no going back. People either love it or hate it because it's, we're performing a show, like we're performing our own music. So it's like either people like the music or they don't, and that's fine. Do you think genre, have you noticed anything with the genres? If you were doing like a hip hop set, people would be expecting more scratching. Well, I guess versus a house set, you'd always expect that, but. Or, yeah, or not necessarily. Um, I don't think that's it necessarily. I think it, it comes down to the DJ and what they're known for, I think. I, I really hate the term, but it's become so like commonplace, but like branding of a, of a DJ, right? If someone is known for doing a lot of scratching in how they present themselves online, Instagram or videos or mixes they put out there, and a big part of what they do is involving scratching, let's say, let's say someone just mixes, normally mixes like hip hop and funk, for example, and then their build is playing a house set, for me, as someone who would be familiar with them, I'd be probably expecting that, perhaps, and see what they do with it. I find that really interesting. I think if you're consistent with your how you present yourself online, having some level of consistency really helps with that. Not only by like people going, oh yeah, that's what this person does, but also if you're working in a, a genre outside of hip hop, it allows other people from that scene to understand that you're really about that sort of thing. It's not just a gimmick of going, oh, I'm gonna scratch over, these beats 
for a one-off performance. You can, they can see you're really about it. It almost comes back to what you were saying at the start about how it's context and like knowing your audience. And it's like, sure, if you're being booked for you as, as a DJ, then yeah, that, that you're bringing that whole kind of brand with you, as you say. But it's like, if you're a club stroke bar DJ, which is kind of what, the, that, I guess that's why when I've tested the waters when I've been DJing, that's all, all I've been doing. So it, of course, people aren't expecting it. And it's just like, they're just like, why is he doing that? Like, I just want to dance. Cause that's, that's what you've been booked for as that kind of DJ, isn't it? So it's, um, it's all linked, I suppose. Yeah, I think in that context, probably like less is more because you're, you're providing a service really, rather than it being about you to an extent. It's yeah, yeah. And it's understanding that, con un understanding that context and knowing it's, so, it's okay. I guess another question which I thought that maybe people who are watching might be thinking is like, oh, that's cool. You're John First, do you know what I mean? You're like world champion, like 2013 DMC guy. Of course you can scratch and people are gonna like it. At what point did you feel comfortable scratching and like incorporating that all into your sets? Um, do you know what I mean? In terms of like your skill level. Before I would like had like a, the following with the after my success in DMC and stuff like that, I'd been doing club DJing for quite a long time, and I, I yeah I've been incorporating like scratching and and stuff like that since like I, I, my first gig pretty much. I, my first my first gig was at a hip hop gig, and I went down to the one before and just saw that I saw that they were like playing all the sort of music I liked. We're making people dance, but then incorporating little bits of scratching here and there. That was my mindset. I just like like okay, I'm gonna like make people dance with the records I like, but then maybe like cut it up a few times. I actually probably did too much and like went in a few times, but like if within that context, because it was like a very like headsy hip hop night, people were into it. But I, d I did that research before and like attended a couple of the events. It was like a regular, like bi-monthly thing and got a good understanding of what it was and what I could and probably couldn't get away with. I was fortunate that there was that kind of platform available of like a very headsy hip hop night. I mean, like the, the D DJ who booked me a DJ with loads of like sick rappers and stuff like that. So like, it was a very, very like welcoming environment for me to do the sort of set I wanted to play. If I'd played at like, um, like a chain bar or something like that, I probably wouldn't have been able to get away with that same sort of set. I'd had like following sets that happened later. I'd been booked because they see I was starting to get bookings in like the hip hop circuit around where I, where I lived. Uh, but there are more commercial venues and I could just tell straight away I was just like dying <laughs> in this little booth. <laughs> and just knowing I should, I should not be the person doing this gig. So understanding like, okay, I'm gonna just focus on making people dance. And like the scratching is like my like victory lap if I make that work. It's easy for me to say like, you can do loads of scratching straight away, but you can do if you, if you like, if you're able to find that platform or that, that party or that live stream event, whatever it is yeah. that is targeted towards that audience. So it's doing some research for that too, or starting up your own thing as well, like your own event that creates a platform for that. If you've got 20, 30 mates to come to like a, a small bar and, and, and listen to you, to you play what you want to play. And that gives you that kind of like comfort zone, if you like, to try those those things and make it work because you're setting the, the rules. And this is like a, a grumpy bar manager who's like, <laughs> wanting you to play something different. Because you've, you've done that a couple of times. Well, as far as I know, at least twice, you got your beat, is it beta? And you got your, your old one drop, right? So I guess that's where you were doing that and you were going, right? Oh, to to totally. Um, um, both of those were made for that exact reason, really. Like um, drop I started because like I had this interest in initially in doing like live sets involving like decks and samplers and stuff. And then booking other people who were touring at the time who were doing similar stuff and then uh, I, moved, I moved city for uni and it ended up being a mixture of that and then like club stuff I was into that wasn't being represented. And I wanted to play out because I was so super into that sort of music at the time. And I wanted to be able to create a space where I could do that and, then, and, and also do some live stuff and cutting and stuff like that. Started off really quiet and then I had to build up a fan base, playing other events, networking, maybe not doing as much scratching at those sort of events and then going, hey, here's the event where I, I do exactly what I'm like about. If you're interested, come down and did that for a few years and then the beats the thing was a bit like that too was like trying to do to play more like chilled out stuff it's very much like the the long way of doing things though like 
because you have to know you have to build an audience for it and in some ways doing doing something online is a, a bit easier like building an audience on say something like twitch is amazing because you've got the world at your fingertips and you're streaming <laughs> it's the yeah i'm not gonna say it's the easiest way to, to to do it like trying to like start your own night locally just doing represent yourself online is i think it is been one of the the best things about this move to twitch over the last year or so is that people can just do what it is they're about and showcase that however they want to so that's really good advice basically so just when you're playing whenever you're playing just do you essentially it's kind of what you're saying so it's like building your brand and when you get the opportunity, but also, I suppose... Yes, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's understanding when and when you can do that. But then, if you have the luxury, of course, like, being picky about choosing situations where you can do that to the best you can. And knowing, like, if you've, if you've been booked at a disco event, you probably couldn't play Hardcore Jungle for two hours, and vice versa, or, like, for an event which is more background music, and then you just want to go in and shred R and Fresh for three hours, that's probably not going to be the one either. So it's like, trying to build as best you can a scenario, what it is you want to do to shine. Okay, so th this one's not completely related, but it kind of is. It Basically, I saw Reaver, he'd done a podcast in, um, I think he said being called a turntablist is like the mark of Kane, and it's kind of like... I've, uh, I've saw that too, I know the one you mean. I guess what, what you're saying is like, you know, as soon as you get marked turntablist, the promoters are like, oh, you know, that that's a certain thing, he, he, and you're not necessarily going to get booked. You, you seem like someone who's kind of skirted that like knife edge pretty well. So what's your kind of take on that, I suppose? To a degree, I understand where um, he's coming from. Um, I think they're outside our bubble of scratchy, scratchy nerd friends. There's a um, preconception that we are scratchy nerd friends. Sometimes people can think of scratching and, and instantly think of like, they're not gonna look at the audience and they're just gonna scratch for an hour and it's, it's gonna clear the room, right? Of course, both of us know infinite examples of all-rounded DJs. Ones that come to mind like Mr. Thing, Coco, uh, Craze, A-Track, J-Rock, like loads and loads of DJs who are able to be amazing like club DJs, have clearly defined styles, but also be able to like do different stuff with them as well um, and incorporate scratching in their shows and be able to do amazing performances that work in that environment. It's, it's, it's an unfair stereotype, if you like. The best way to get around that is you, using your, your online presence as your portfolio of examples, how you can make that work. So after I had the success with DMC, I want to use like these new eyes on me now to go like, hey, I also do this too. And I still use the scratching stuff that you guys have found out about me and go like, hey, I do this too. And maybe you'll be into that as well. So like, I was really conscious about putting loads of mixes out in, or well, like pretty much consistently since DMC. So like guest mixes or like I did a podcast for, for a number of years and I've done like guest radio shows and on different stations and things like that. Uh, to go like, hey, this is what I'm about. This is the sort of music I play. And you can see how scratching would work in that. But then also still putting out my like routines, which are like for that, that more like hardcore scratching audience, because obviously I want to like make stuff for them too, because I was like, I appreciate them so much and what they've done for, for me. So I guess that comes down to your style in that like certain beat juggling can be a little bit just like wavy and a bit too kind of difficult to, it's not very palatable, but you've got that kind of style, which is you're doing these tricks and it sounds like, um, you know, you can see that you're doing it and you can hear like all these intricacies, but it never really interrupts the flow of like the music. Is that a conscious thing that you've gone to do? Or is it just something that that's just how your style has developed? In terms of the, the, any type of juggling like I do in a club environment is all trick mixing. Like I don't do breakdown juggles really in, in that particular environment. I, I only use one deck. So like it's all like mutes, chops, doubles, and like various like trick mix fills. And partially that's due to the type of music I play. Like it's very, I, I play like a, a, a big spectrum. A lot of events that drum and bass audience will like in, uh, have been into where maybe the tempo is a bit more consistent and it's all about small changes in rhythm over, gradually over a set. I'm, I'm generalizing a lot, but like in that sort of environment, 
rhythm changes are really noticeable. So if I suddenly go from like consistent 160 or 170 BPM for like 10 minutes and suddenly it breaks down into like halftime swing or something like that for like 20 seconds and then back, back again, unless that's done in a really, really like efficient, clever way, which obviously it can be done. It can be, it, it can kind of just be like a, what? Yeah, <laughs> kind it's of moment. super jarring and everyone's just gonna yeah. be like, whoa, like. I think it just depends on what sort of music you play and like type of music I play and the context of like big dramatic rhythm changing juggles don't necessarily lend themselves well to how I see my style working. If, if, if I was doing more like, I'd say like more funk and hip hop stuff, I would definitely include a lot more like breakdowny stuff or like doing like real like multi-genre, multi-tempo stuff where it's like switching all the time. Yeah. BPM differences are already built into that, on, into hip hop already, because you've got like the super slow stuff. It's so much wider, yeah. Electro stuff and it's like already a bit more expected. Is there anything else you'd want to add to that? Because like, I think we've covered most of the stuff. Oh no, I'm going to try and think of some like in, inspo, inspo, inspo. It's just like... Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, sum it up. See if you can sum it up. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess what I'd say is like, just, just have ha have fun and maybe like, you might you might find like, like your particular interest of like sounds or style isn't maybe represented in other DJs you know, and you feel like, oh, maybe what I'm doing won't work and maybe I have to like, change and maybe that's just for me to do at home. I used to be like that completely and I've always just been like, very like, adamant about what it is I do. Whatever style you want to incorporate turntablism in, be it something that's been done before, or be it like a, a genre that you've not heard it with before, or maybe, yeah, trying it with production, whatever it is. Just keep at it, stay consistent with what it is you do, and develop your own like style and sound, and that's what's gonna set you apart. If you don't see what it is you wanna do on online from other DJs or on the radio or whatever, that doesn't mean it can't work. With a lot of effort, you you can be that 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 thing. And yeah, and to sum, summarize like the, the, the main point from today is like it's uh, just understanding the context of where you're playing and know that whatever it is you love doing, you can find an audience and like a platform for it. Sometimes it means you have to develop it yourself. Sometimes it means doing some digging to find like a group of people who you can do it with and a bit of networking, but it's it's all possible. You can find that thing, even if it's super niche. Nice, yeah, that, that last bit is the one. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. yeah just, just put that in, <laughs> just grab the rest. <laughs> that could be the whole video. <laughs> this, right, yeah. this is John. Oh, amazing, man. Again, massive thanks to John first. You're an absolute bad man DJ and your production's sick. And yeah, just keep doing what you're doing, dude. You're absolutely killing it. If you're still here, thank you very much. I know this is a slightly longer video than I normally do. So thanks for sticking around. If you liked it, please drop a like. And it'd be also really cool if you would consider joining my Discord server. There's a link in the description and I'll also put one up here. We're still a pretty small community, but I'm basically just trying to build a kind of group of like-minded people who are into scratching, sampling, just making music and all that kind of cool stuff, basically. Peas and carrots.